than spores and dust. Anybody ever seen a potato sit up for so long that it starts to sprout other spores and mold because it's been sitting so long? And if anybody know a good potato when they go to Bilo, you'll pick one that is fresh. It, it has some firmness to it. And when you, you peel it off, you can not only make a good baked potato, but you can put it in some green beans or some collards. Amen, somebody. Because good potatoes are filling and they will nourish you for the length of days that are ahead. The same way it is with faithfulness to the gospel. God wants us to be nourished with his word so that we will not only have a hearty appetite, but a healthy attitude. And that is what limits us from being able to share the gospel is because we are so wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in what's going on with us. We're self-absorbed. We're worried about the cares of this life. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Where will we sleep? But Jesus said, the birds of the air, nor the lilies of the field, neither do they toil nor spin. So if his eye is on the sparrow, I know he's going to watch over you. He's not concerned so much about your situation. He's concerned about your destination. And some of us are on our way to hell with a bad attitude. And if you don't learn how to turn that attitude around and think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done, you're going to miss the blessings of life. Worried about what's going on with you. A faithful witness is what he's looking for. A faithful witness knows that they are totally dependent on God for every need. At the point of salvation, God shifts our focus from ourselves to the kingdom of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And you have scores upon scores upon scores of church folks toiling their brains, trying to figure out why everybody in the church can't get on board. Trying to toss a turn late at night, trying to figure out why folk won't do right. And they say that they are Bible-believing leaders and members of the church. And Jesus has already told us that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In academic scholarship, this is a truth that is difficult for many to accept. It means that 20% of the people in any organization are responsible for 80% of the results. In academia, it's called the Pareto effect. It's called the 80-20 rule. It's called this because a study was done in 1896 by an Italian economist by the name of Pareto. And he discovered that 20% of the people in the Italian economy produce 80% of the results. And so it is today. There are very few people that are working to bring about a harvest in this mean old world we live in. This is why many people have given up because they think that it's their labor that's going to produce the results that they're looking for. Some people work 80 and 90 hours a week not realizing that after 70 hours, the rest of us going to Uncle Sam. In other words, you got to learn how to rest a little while. Because all the work ain't up to you. All the money in the world can't be made by one man. And neither can all the work in the world be done by one man. It takes a few laborers to bring forth a harvest. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus said it. And we cannot waste time focusing on what everybody is doing. Because if you're trying to keep up with everybody, that's going to make you a busybody. When you talk to people, all they talk about is other folk and instead of talking about Jesus I don't want to hear about what's going on with everybody I want to know what the Lord has done in your life we cannot waste time focusing on other people to the point where we focus our faith on the Lord of the harvest look at what Jesus told us in the next verse he said pray that the Lord of the harvest will make you ready for the harvest coming 
This is why we are looking at the Bible today because it gives us a valuable lesson that in Luke chapter 10, it records the account of Jesus' commissioning of 72 disciples to witness the gospel message. Whom God sends may be sure that he will along, he will go along with them and give them everything they need. How many know that Jesus is with us right now? His servants should apply themselves to the work under a deep concern for precious souls. That's what you should see when you come into the church. Not what people are wearing and not what kind of shoes they have on, not what they're driving. You should see the condition of their souls. Jesus said, what profit a man to gain the whole wide world and to lose his very soul. That's what you need to ask yourself tonight. If that if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? Have you accepted Christ in such a way that your life is real? Everything that you're doing for the master, is it real? Is your prayer life, is it real? Is your service, is it real? Uh, what you're doing, uh, are you doing it to please man? Uh, or what you're doing, are you doing it to, to please God? Uh, and you need to find in yourself uh, if you are a witness. Amen. True service to him comes out of communion with him. Yes, Just maybe say you got to spend time with him. When you commune with God and that service that, that others see as worthless to others, it means something to him which is done to glorify the kingdom. Many people are serving in the church with selfish motives. If you don't know it, look at the word of God. They're doing it because they have a title. And it should not be because you have a title. It should be because you have a touch. And when you have been touched by the Lord, it doesn't matter what folks say to you you or what they say about you, you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to be a witness for him. Somebody asked the question today, how do we produce faithful witnesses? We need faithful witnesses in the church because without a faithful witness, without a credible witness, without somebody that's truthful and honest, then possibly the word of God is labor that is in vain. But this is why Paul told us uh, that we, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. And the reason why he knew that he had heard the gospel for himself. And Jesus has given us three things to take with us today in order to understand what it means to be a faithful witness. The first thing that we need to do in order to be a faithful witness is to pray earnestly. Touch neighbor and say pray earnestly. Look at verse number two. It says that he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Then therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest that he send our workers into this harvest. Pray earnestly means that it comes with asking with a sense of urgency, presuming that God already knows what you need. If you study the scriptures, you will understand that, that we're not telling God anything that he doesn't already know when we pray. Yeah. But we're earnestly praying, saying that, Lord, when you do it, do it for me right now. See, I'm a little struggling preacher, and I can't wait 20 years for God to send some witnesses to the Mount of Angel Missionary Baptist Church. I need some witnesses right now, because somebody is about to lose their job. Somebody has already lost a mother or a father. Somebody has lost hope. And God needs some witnesses here that say, you can lose a child, you can lose a mother, you can even lose your home, and God will be a very present help in the time of trouble. Can I get one witness that you ain't got to wait for something good to happen in order to praise God? Sometimes he will be that very present help in the time of trouble. We got to pray earnestly. 
Not that God doesn't know that we need some witnesses, but we got to pray with a sense of urgency and say, Lord, do it for us right now. Send us uh, some people who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Send us uh, some folks uh, who ain't scared to wave their hands and say hallelujah and stand on a testimony about what the Lord is. Uh, send us some folk uh, who ain't ashamed to tell where they've been and what they've done and say that that was then, but this is now. We got so many folk in church who ain't never did nothing, ain't never said nothing, and that's why they can't praise God, because God can't save folk who ain't never sinned. I don't know about you, but I've seen it. And the reason why I know what I know is because he brought me out of a dark place. And nobody could do it but him. So when you pray, move from the light bill, phone bill prayer, to an earnest prayer for God to send out a manual of some witnesses. As many times we go out into the community to witness, we only have a few who are willing to witness. Some say they're working, that's fine. Some say that they're ill, that's fine. But, but what about everybody else who ain't working and who ain't sick? Why is it that they don't want to go out and witness? Jesus said you got to pray earnestly. Maybe the prayers that we're praying are so focused on what others are going through that our prayers should shift from the pains and problems of others to the purpose of a witness in the first place is for God to send more witnesses. Jesus had 12 disciples, but after the 12, he commissioned 70 others to go out into the kingdom and compel men and women to convert to the gospel message, to turn from their wicked ways to repent of their sins because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those of us who are Bible readers know that there were 70 elders that were assisting Moses in the book of Numbers chapter 11 plus Nedad and Eldad which made even 72. Perhaps the gospel writer is reminding us that just as Moses had 70 to assist him with the, with the kingdom message then so does Jesus have 70 to help them with the message now. Whether you believe it or not just because every church has a pastor does not mean that the pastor has to do all the work. God needs helpers in the vineyard to, to labor so that there will be a harvest. That's why the harvest takes time because it's a process involved. You have to plow the field. You have to sow the seeds. You have to cover the seeds. You have to water the seeds. And then you have to wait for the harvest to come. Some of us want to be called to preach, licensed to preach, and pastoring all on the same day. But we got to understand that it takes time for the harvest to be brought forth. This is why we got to pray earnestly. If God is not sending those that are with us now into the harvest, pray that he sends some others who are not ashamed of the God they serve, that he will send us a harvest of souls who need to be saved. Amen. Amen. Pray earnestly. Mm -hmm. After we pray earnestly, there's a second thing we need to do. We need to preach enthusiastically. Wow. Truth about us as a folk, as a church folk, we can't stand a boring preacher. We don't want nobody just trying to put us to sleep. Amen. We want somebody that's got some fire in them to preach some fire into us. That's our tradition. That's our culture. That's why we have call and response in the African American traditions because we're used to having a conversation with the preacher. We're not just used to having the preacher talk to us. We understand that the same word that's being preached to us not only has to be preached through us. In other words, the seeds that are being sown in this message have to be sown in what Jesus called good soil. Jesus is tired of rocky ground and he's tired of thorns. 
hands. He described that in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew uh, that some seeds fall among the rocky ground. Uh, that means as soon as the word is sown, uh, it falls among hard hearts. Uh, who don't want to hear a word the preacher got to say? Uh, and some seeds fall among thorns. Uh, those are the people that try to say uh, that the word was not for you. Uh, it was for somebody else. Uh, they try to choke the truth out of the word. They try to take away the fire and the meaning because uh, they want you to stay just like them. <laughs> but when you preach with some enthusiasm, <laughs> it does not matter how many frowns you see. <laughs> it does not matter how many fake smiles you see. <laughs> you know that you are filled with the Holy Spirit <laughs> because that's what he gave them in order to go out <laughs> and cast out a devil. <laughs> he gave them the Holy Ghost <laughs> so that they can say to the devil, <laughs> get out of my way. <laughs> that's the only way the devil's going to get out of your way. <laughs> you got to be Holy Ghost feel. You can look at that devil and say, even though you want me to do wrong, I'm going to do what's right. And that's why I got God living in me. It's because I'm not waiting for a pep talk or a pat on the back or a praise tip in order to be a servant of God. I got Jesus living on the inside and I got a gospel message to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at what he says here. He says, now go. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. My brothers and sisters, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to say that Jesus must have been out of his mind. Because everybody knows that wolves eat sheep. As a matter of fact, a lamb is not even a sheep. A lamb is a baby sheep. And when you see what Jesus is saying is, is that the most vulnerable people are the ones that he sends out. In other words, you can't send strong folk out because strong folk go think it's their own strength that's going to get the message out to people. A lot of times we look for the tall pines to be the, on the front line. But that's not what Jesus said. A lot of us don't read the Bible. That's why we don't know what we're talking about. It says, now go, I'm sending you out. As lambs among wolves. A lamb is a baby sheep, and these are the most vulnerable. These are the ones that had to be protected by the sheep because the wolves were going after them first because they were the weakest. And it was easy prey. This is the way Jesus said, I'm sending you out as easy prey. But guess what? Don't carry a money bag. Don't carry a traveling bag. Don't carry sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, peace be to this house. In other words, he's equipping them with a message. He's not equipping them with material. See, some of us got to have all of the right conditions in our personal life, in our financial life, in our private life, and in our public life in order for us to share the gospel message. But we forget that God is teaching us that it's not about us when we're sharing the message. It's not about what we drive, where we live, what we're wearing. It's about going in Jesus' name with a spirit of enthusiasm. Now, such a neighbor say a spirit of enthusiasm. A spirit that got some pep in yourself. Can't you see there's lambs whistling as they know the wolves are hiding on both sides of the hill. And they're saying they're on their way to grandmama's house anywhere. They say, Lord, what big eyes you have. What big teeth you have. I don't care what wolf is after me. I know that once God's head is on me, I can go anywhere. He's sending you out mm -hmm. like lambs mm -hmm. among wolves. Evil is not just in Saudi Arabia. It's not just in Syria. It's not just in Turkey or Bangladesh or Orlando or San Bernardino. Evil is everywhere. That's right. Amen. Want them to be aware that the gospel is not about them. The gospel has to be in them. Right. Right. Pray earnestly. Mm -hmm. Preach enthusiastically. Right. But thirdly and lastly, you got to praise endlessly. Just things that don't let your praise go out. Look at verse number 11. It says, we are wiping off as a witness against you even the dust of your town that clings to your feet. 
The word wipe off comes from the word apomaso, which means to touch or to handle. My brothers and sisters, there are places that we go that have spirits Amen. when we get there. Yes, You're right. That's right. Not just in our churches, it's people's houses. Right, right. They're places of employment. Mm -hmm. They're relationships that people are in. Mm -hmm. They carry spirits with them, and the spirits are very dusty. Mm -hmm. They're very dingy and dirty. They're very dark. Mm -hmm. And Jesus don't want us to just encounter those spirits in such a way that it makes an impression on us and it takes away all the enthusiasm that we have about the gospel because of what we see and who we meet. See, when he's talking about a town, he's not just talking about a geographic location. He's talking about a particular ideology that is in a place that influences people. In America, we have something called relativism, which is a lie that says there's no absolute truth. It's a lie that's been ingrained in two generations of people that believe that they are entitled to their opinion and that their opinion takes precedence and authority over the gospel message. But Jesus wanted us to know that that's a lie for the pit of hell. You may be entitled to feel to believe whatever you want to believe, but if your life and your, your living it does not line up with the gospel message, you are going to burn forever in a place called hell. And this is why he's teaching this message to us, not because he's wanting to condemn us because he's wanted to punish us. He wants us to get the time now to get it right. He wants us to live our lives with a sense of urgency so that we are not allowing the mess of the world to cling to us. And some of us have hanged around worthy people so long that we start to smell like them. We start to look like them. And we even start to act like them. But Jesus says wipe it off. In another translation he says shake it off. That's what you got to do. You got to shake it off. When folk in the workplace start messing around with you, you got to shake it off. When folk in your house start talking trash, you got to shake it off. Even when folk in church start looking at you sideways, you got to shake it off. When I was growing up, we used to go to some folk house and you know, we sit down and watch TV, and while we watch the TV, I thought they well, had a commercial on the TV. You know how they got the roaches in the commercial, but sometimes it would be a commercial. It would be a roach that was actually on their TV, and everybody tried to act like they ain't see it. Roach sitting there waving at everybody. You get ready to sit down in their house, you have to brush the seat off and make sure that you ain't taking that home with the ladies. You have to check your pocketbook and empty it out when you get out of the car because they got bugs everywhere. We got some messy people all around us and you can't allow the mess that's on them to get on you because your number one job is to share the gospel message in spite of what you may be going through, in spite of what you may see, or even what you may hear. Jesus is teaching the disciples that they always should have a praise on their lips. I wish that was the church of the day. I wish our praise wasn't so conditional. Many of us today have a conditional praise and we're waiting to hear what the doctor's results will say before we say thank you. We're waiting to hear whether or not we got the job before we say hallelujah. We're waiting to hear if Pookie going to get out of jail before we say, thank you, Jesus. But that's not the way God wants us to be. He wants us to remember what the psalm says. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. When the 72 return, they have some good news. They are excited. And so is Jesus. That they have the power to cast out devils. I'm closing here now. It says that after the tensions and the misunderstandings had occurred over recent weeks, there is joy in seeing the power of the enemy broken. That's what you want the anointing to do. You don't want the anointing to draw attention to you. You want the anointing to destroy some yokes. That's what we need is some yoke breaking gospel preaching. We need the wicked to cease from troubling and the weary to be at rest. Jesus reminds his disciples that there is something even more wonderful than defeating their enemies. 
<laughs> the time, their own peace with God and the future of their home in heaven are secure. <laughs> this is a high point for Jesus because he didn't just save us so that we could get the devil off of us. He saved us so that we could enjoy him every day, all day in a place called heaven. At last he sees progress and power in the ordinary people that he called to be his followers. He is ecstatic with joy that God's purpose is being fulfilled. There's a song they used to sing in the culture church that says I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about who he is to me. And I'm so glad that my praise is not conditional. My praise is endless to the fact that I have to remember that God paid a price for me to be a witness. I might come around some dirty people. I might come around some dark or dusty people. But he gave me some specific instructions. And that is to shake the dust off my feet as a testimony against them. And everybody in here can identify with that. Everybody in here has got a testimony. Everybody in here knows that folks will talk about you. Folks will scandalize your name. Folks will say all kind of negative things to you and about you. But you got to be a witness. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? It doesn't matter what you say to me. It doesn't matter what you think about me. God has been good to me. Is there anybody here can say to well, others, may curse them. God will be a blessing to you. It makes no difference what you're going through. You're going to make it. God's going to see you through. I know that God is able to do anything but fail. I got to get out of here and tell you a story on this Independence Week. There was a young man that was in the Army. He was in the Army of the United States of America. And when he signed up to be a soldier, the first night of basic training, he went into his barracks, and in there were 15 other men. And while they were passing the time drinking and gambling and playing cards, this young man was a Christian. And every night before he would go to bed, he would get down on his knees and pray like his daddy taught him to pray. He said, Father, I stretch my hands to thee no other help I know if thou will withdraw thyself from me tell me whether shall I go as he kept on praying they would throw their cards at him they would pour liquor on him they would even take off their boots and throw it at him he cried so much that night he went to his chaplain the next day and asked for some advice he said brother preacher chaplain what should I do and said the chaplain well you are not at home now and the other men who sleep in that barracks they have just as much a right to sleep there as you. It makes them mad to hear you pray. So the Lord will hear you every time you pray. Why don't you try getting on your knees and say a silent prayer. He said, sir, God ain't hard of hearing. Why don't you just pray a silent prayer? For weeks after that, the boy did what the chaplain said. He went down in his bed and he prayed a little prayer. And weeks later, he went back to the chaplain. He said, chaplain, I took your advice. He said, what happened? He said, well, I did it for about two or three nights. He said, well, how did it work? The young soldier said, well, I felt like a whipped dog. After the first and second night, I got out of bed and knelt down and prayed. The chaplain said, well, what happened next? He said, after that, that we had a prayer meeting with about two or three more who wanted to hear about Jesus. Anybody here that know it may look bad the first night, it may even look bad on the second night, but touch your neighbor say, keep on praying. That's why you got to get down on your knees and you got to pray earnestly. You got to preach enthusiastically. You got to praise endlessly. They might lie on you. 
They might talk about you. They might throw things at you. But you got to learn to shake it off. I don't care. You can talk about me as much as you please. The more you talk, I'm going to stay on my knees. Just a neighbor say, keep on praying. Keep on fasting. Keep on trusting. Keep on praising. Because God is good. Is there anybody here that can wave your hands and say, God got a witness. If nobody else is a witness, I'm going to be a witness. I'll go if I have to go by myself. Is there anybody here that can say God is good? If you know he's good, say yeah. Say yeah. Wave your hands and say yeah. Can I get one witness? That God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Thank you.